Hello and welcome to our November Wednesday webinar. My name is Benedict Brox and I'm the communications officer here. Our monthly webinars are based on our reports and um, which are available from our website www.iea-coal.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after one-off registration. The subject for today's webinar is Coal Utilization Policy and Technology Trends, presented by Dr. Andrew Menchner. Good afternoon, and on behalf of the IEA Clean Coal Centre, it's a pleasure to be talking to you today. As my colleague Benedict has said, I'm going to cover various aspects of coal utilisation policy and global technology trends, particularly relating to coal power. This sets out the scope of my presentation. First of all, I'm going to take a few minutes to explain who we are, what we do, and why we do it. I'm then going to talk about the strategic importance of the energy trilemma, followed by some global data for new coal power plants, and then follow that with examples of global variations in gold coal power trends. In particular, I'm going to look at EU policy impacts on coal use. I'm going to look on a more positive note at the coal policies and impacts of coal use in Africa and the Middle East. And then finally, on a bigger, bigger scale indeed, the coal policies and impacts we see in Asia. Finally, I'll say a few words about where do we go from here. And in there, I'm going to include a few, a few examples of a very, very new approach to using coal for non-energy products. Okay, who are we? Well, we are a technology collaboration program. We're organized under the auspices of the International en Energy Agency, and they mandate our program of work, but we are functionally and legally autonomous. Right, that gets the legal bit out of the way. More interestingly, we are funded by national governments, contracting parties, and by corporate industrial organizations, all of which have an interest in the clean and efficient use of coal for a number, wide range of applications. In particular, we're dedicated to providing independent information and analysis on how coal can become a cleaner source of energy. And in particular, we're looking to see how that can best be made compatible with the appropriate UN Sustainable Development Goals. This actually, this slide shows the development goals that are particularly relevant to coal. These are shown across the eight across the bottom of the original 17. These are ones that you can say, okay, coal, coal fits within those, including particularly um, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. We have an operating framework for our program that identifies and publicizes the best practice in every aspect of the coal production, transport, processing and utilization chain. And we're looking there, and I'll say a bit more about this in a moment, looking at how you can best balance security of supply, energy affordability and meeting environmental issues and standards. Therefore, trying to counter any unwanted impacts to ensure the well-being of societies worldwide. In particular, we cover policy and regulatory issues. We clearly look at efficiency improvements, looking at how you can best lower greenhouse and non-greenhouse gas emissions. We look at how you can reduce water stress in those parts of the world where that is an issue when you're operating almost any coal power plant. We look at financial resourcing, we look at the markets, and we look at overall technology development and deployment. And linked to that, we're looking at how you can best ensure poverty alleviation through universal access to robust and reliable electricity, which is what you get from coal. And indeed, we also look at the social uh, license to operate. Right, moving on to the energy trilemma. This little triangle on the right uh, left-hand side of the slide, excuse me, this, is, I would suggest, is the basis for every rational energy strategy in the world. 
it sets out three points that you would be looking to meet as best you can in terms of setting up your strategic approach to energy usage. First and foremost, you must have security of energy supply. Without that, you have, don't have any sort of stability in your systems and you're in, a, you're in a real mess. You're also looking at the energy you're using to in your various applications. You're looking at the affordability of that energy so that when you use it, you can still see um, environmental development going on within your economy, um, economic development, sorry, within your economy. And then finally, you're looking at meeting the environmental standards and regulations yeah, appropriate to your particular country. And that nowadays includes climate protection in particular, in some cases, carbon emissions. The important thing about the energy trilemma is that it represents an energy compromise. You cannot, uh, you, you cannot maximize your um, achievement of all three of these conditions. It's not sustainable to just focus on one without consideration of the others. So it is a compromise, and I think that's an important point to stress. First message of the day, we are living in an increasingly carbon constrained world, but I think it's most important to point out that there is no one size fits all solution to countering climate change. The world is not a homogeneous place, it is a heterogeneous place with different regions at different stages in the industrial development cycle. And clearly, if you're a very advanced region, then you may go to a certain type of solution for countering climate change. Equally, if you're a developing region, um, still starting to uh, build up your economy, looking at urbanization and other such issues, you're going to go for a different, different approach. And this is, this is a fundamental point that none of us should ever forget. And I'll come back to that in many of the slides that I'm going to show in, this, in a few moments. Some statistics. Let's put things in context um, in terms of what you know, coal is being, how coal is being used. Um, for example, this is uh, uh, International Energy Agency data, uh, and this is showing coal production in millions of tons from 1971 through to 2018. The brown band at the bottom represents the amount of coal that has and now continues to be used in OECD countries, and you can see in overall terms of that, that that's a that's a pretty flat curve. In contrast, if you look at China you can see that from about 2000, uh, year 2000, there was a sudden steep increase in coal use as the country sought to um, drive its industrial processes, build up the, the, the energy related infrastructures in the country to improve the overall standards for the people in that country and improve the economic value of the country. And you can see that rose and it, it's sort of dipping a little bit towards the end, but the expectation is that that will at worst plateau out for the next 10 or so or 15 years. Above that, there is the rest of the world. And again, from about 20 to 2007, you can see again an increase in the amount of coal that's being used in that way. To put that in context, the world's total coal production in 2018 was about 7.8 billion tons, of which China produced just under 3.6 billion tons. So clearly, coal use worldwide is dominated by China, but it's by no means just China, and in particularly the rest of the world, as I shall indicate in future slides, is using and continuing to use considerable amounts of coal for reasons that I'll discuss shortly. This is. Um, this is uh, another this graph that we we put together at the Clean Coal Centre and use very frequently. This is showing the CO2 emissions that you would get in grams per kilowatt hour of electricity production from a coal-fired plant, and it's showing on the on the x-axis the efficiency on a percentage basis, a lower heating value net basis, and it's been broken in uh, four color bands which reflect different aspects or different levels of um, steam quality and steam production and steam energy concentrations um, depending on the type of coal power plant that you're using. 
The traditional system was uh, the so-called subcritical system, where the temperatures were mo relatively modest, 540 centigrade maximum, and modest pressures. And you can see that though there's a change over, there's been a change over that as efficiencies improved on those units, um, you uh, you can get down by maybe 30, 40 percent, but or 30 percent certainly, but you can't get any further. Uh, but when you go beyond, when you increase the temperatures and pressures such that you get beyond the 39% efficiency into the supercritical range, you get a further reduction. And as you continue that process, going to have a higher steam temperatures and pressures, you get into the ultra supercritical range. And beyond that, there's a lot of fancy design work, in particular arising in China, which can take you several percentage points more through maximizing performance, minimizing energy losses and heat losses, and minimizing operational losses. Two things, are, two plants I want to highlight. Uh, there's the GE Steam H plant, where it, GE will offer you a plant on commercial basis that's gonna get you an efficiency of about 49%. The other plant I wanna highlight is the Weigao Chow Number three power plant in China, which has an efficiency just under 49%, uh, 48%. But again, it's a great example of a plant where there's massive innova innovation from the chief engineer and his staff. And when I get on to some uh, other aspects of that later, that Wai Gao Chao is going to feature very prominently. But you can see in overall terms, as the efficiency has been improved, we're getting, you know, maybe saving about 50% of the carbon emissions that you'd otherwise have if you can get up to the advanced USC conditions, which are, admittedly are not yet quite commercially available. But the ultra supercritical ones over that range in certainly are. Just again, to put things in context, coal currently provides 41% of global electricity. It's a also an essential raw material in the production of 70% of the world's steel and 90% of the world's cement. So it's, it's you know, coal is a rather important uh, energy source for some of the critical things that um, make the, um, make life on this planet bearable. Um, you know, steel is used, for example, in uh, wind turbines or whatever, as well as in, in power plants. It's a you know, the structure of many buildings of steel, etc. And world cement is increasingly in needed as uh, with the urbanization programs that are ongoing. I would suggest that coal is set to remain a significant and integral part of the global energy mix for well into the future. The key issue is that we do everything we can, recognizing that fact, but also ensuring the energy efficiency and environmental performance are as good as we can make them at this time and hopefully to improve further in the future. Moving on, um, global coal power, new capacity trends. I've got a, a number of slides here that will illustrate some, I think, interesting facts. This is showing the current or oh, near near current capacity. This was taken uh, put together uh, June 2018 uh, using data from the Platt system, and it's showing the operational capacity of the USC, which, if you recall from a few slides ago is the most state-of-the-art technology that we have at present for coal power. And you can see in Asia, uh, this technology is mostly focused on Asia, and there's 220, or was 224 gigawatts, there'll be more than that now. The next area where there was a significant amount was some 10% um, of what we're seeing in Asia, and that was mostly in Germany, and uh, the Netherlands, but unfortunately, due to the approach that's being adopted within the EU, uh, most of this technology is, is going to be prematurely retired, which will have consequences. That said about the amount of plant that's operational, there's another 153 gigawatts or so of plant under construction in, I think it's 32 countries. Um, you can also see on here the construction of other energy sources, solar, wind, hydro, geo, nuclear and gas, or, and biomass and waste. And you see in this instance, coal is uh, a significant part of the forthcoming uh, coal-fired capacity, 
in a wide range of countries. The global coal power fleet is now about uh, 2,030 gigawatts, and about 700 gigawatts of that has been installed since 2010, much of it in China. Uh, of the new capacity that's being constructed that I've just referred to, that's actually being built, as I said, in 32 countries. And one of the things that's been stressed by us and others, if you're going to build a new coal plant, build the most modern plant you can achieve, which will be an ultra supercritical coal-fired unit. And this is over 80 gigawatts of that 153 is USC plant. Following that, the most of the rest, another 54 gigawatts, is supercritical, which is, again is an improvement on the subcritical, which there's just a little bit being continuing to be built. And that's mainly in small units, which um, are being built in countries, many of them in Africa, where it would be difficult, there's not enough capacity available to um, utilize a, a larger and more efficient unit. This shows the planned power capacity for coal and the other energy sources. Um, sorry, I must apologize, this isn't quite on the same scale as the construction one that I showed earlier. But in fact, there's 274 gigawatt plants at the planning stage. Now, I think the key point to make here is just because a plant is at the planning stage doesn't mean it's going to make its way all through the various costings, uh, technical designs and so on to the point where it will be constructed and then operated. But again, there's a lot of interest in taking this technology forward. And I think we can be sure of one thing, of that 274 gigawatts, a lot of it is going to make its way through to um, the, uh, the operational stage in, over the next few years. I'm now going to move on to talk a little about project developments by reason, region. Excuse me. Uh, I've got a couple of good examples because I just like looking at power plants. The power plant on the left is in was um, is operated by JCO. It's built in Tokyo Bay, and it's the Isogo Ultra Supercritical Unit, two 1,000 megawatt units. And the, and the thing about this is Tokyo Bay is a, a high density population region, but the plant has been built there with the support of the local populace. It's coal fired. You can't actually see any coal. The coal is brought in by barge. It's stored in underground bank bunkers and the coal uh, passed through um, enclosed tubes, etc., up to the through the grinding processes and then into the firing into the burners. Uh, thing I would highlight on this, they even built the, um, the stack on an elliptical basis to minimize its impact on the skyline. And in fact, there's a very nice temple uh, on the round here, at which point you could actually see this stack, elliptical or otherwise, for a while. So the power company actually paid for this massive great rhododendron to be transplanted and planted there to, so that it blocked the view of the power plant. The other plant is the Weigal Chow number three power plant, which, as I've said, the, the chief engineer and his staff there have shown amazing innovation on that unit to push its efficiency up from about 43 to 48%. And they've done this by taking care and attention to individual subsets and subunits and better integration of the overall system. And you're starting to see though, that approach applied in a number of other units in which they are involved. And they are also taking forward some of this very exciting work that's getting us into the advanced USC range. I'm now going to say a bit about different regions. Um, and I'm going to start with one that's very negative for coal, which is Western Europe, the European Union, where coal is uh, suffering a very significant and rapid phase out. The policies are set by the European Union, the, the, the countries within that union then set their own policies to uh, take that forward in overall terms. And it must be pointed out that the UK is probably leading in this compared to the rest of Europe. Currently, the UK share of coal is 4% of the power mix. Ten years ago, it was 35%. Government mandate is essentially pushing coal off the grid. And in fact, within about another year or so, there won't be any coal on our grid. 
Uh, so mostly our grid mostly operates on renewables, nuclear and gas. Your operational margin has been small and coal has kept the lights on just about on several times in recent years. So one must presume that there'll be more, more gas plants available to pick up that load in due course. Um, there are other examples that I've included there. You can read them at your leisure because this presentation will be available to you on our web. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's recognizing that policies can drive technology demonstration and deployment. And in Europe, coal, as I said, is, is almost phased out. So uh, projected installed coal capacity for 2030 is going to be about uh, 60 gigawatts. That's less than 50% of what it is at present. You can see dates given over the 2020s where most countries will cease coal use. Um, and by 2030, most of the remaining coal power capacity will be in six EU states, Poland, Germany, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Romania and Greece and the likelihood that, that much of that will be gone by 2038. Let's move to Africa. Africa is a large country with an enormous large population and uh, most of the countries there are short of affordable, reliable power, essentially coal or other fossil fuel power. And it's that they suffer at present from load shedding and blackouts. And there's in fact 640 million Africans lack access to an electricity supply full stop. You're seeing countries there looking to diversify their energy mix so they can get increased access to electricity. Electricity means the lights can be on in the evening and that can improve education because children can sort of read their books and learn and as indeed can adults. And there's an, a recognize, recognition that they need to move this forward. And indeed, national policies in most of these countries are moving increasingly towards coal, which is seen as affordable and reliable. Many of the projects being developed um, uh, are super critical or, or even ultra super critical. But there's also, again, some subcriticals for the reasons I indicated earlier because of the capacity limitations. I should point out that at Till recently, the African Development Bank's lending policy was to support coal plants in Africa, but that has now changed and it's dominated by the introduction of renewables. That's created a vacuum within Africa. And as we all know, vacuums uh, are filled. And China is now playing an increasing role in financing new coal power as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. And I'll be saying a bit more of that towards the end of my presentation. These are a, a snapshot of some of the developments in Africa. You can see there's some quite large projects going ahead in different countries, 600, 700 megawatt uh, supercritical units. Uh, 1.4 gigawatt USC plant is just completed construction in Morocco. Um, Nigeria plans to use coal to meet 30% of its uh, national power demand. And Zimbabwe has proposals um, for a very large 1.8 gigawatt plant and already has a 600 megawatt unit under construction. So things are starting to move quite quickly in certain parts of, of Africa. But funding, as has been presented in some of our webinars in the past, is proving to be an issue unless you uh, are happy to interact uh, and gain finance and support from China. Quick slide on the Middle East. It's not a region you automatically you think of as wanting to use coal and I've indicated here four countries where coal plants are being taken forward for, through the proposal stage the construction stage early stage early days for many of these the one I want to highlight is the project in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and in particular I want to talk about the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority who I'm very pleased to say are one of the members of the IEA Clean Coal Centre they're building a 2.4 gigawatt ultra supercritical plant located next to a desalination unit in the Middle East. And it's planning two more of these to bring its total clean coal technology capacity up to about 3.6 gigawatts. And the expected date for that is 2030. At the same time, the, the Federal Electricity and Water Authority is considering a 1.8 gigawatt USC plant. So even the Middle East with oil and gas 
there's a recognition that coal may well have an important role to play. Right, if we're talking about coal or new coal and developing coal, one really cannot in any way move away or ignore what's happening in Asia. I've used this slide many times. I make no apologies for using it again because I think it very clearly uh, represents a, a key issue that we must all be aware of. This is a map of the world. The bit that's under the spotlight is Asia. You can see there that that's actually, from a land point of view, uh, a relatively small part of the world, but um, um, in, in overall terms. But the important thing to know that if though there's more that there's more than 50% of the population in the world living within Asia rather than the rest of the world. But Asia doesn't have anything like 50% or greater than 50% of the world's energy resources available. So it's a part of the country which is a young country, a young region rather, excuse me, lots of young countries, lots of them trying to drag themselves out of poverty and trying to move forward. And in most cases, they're doing that by building coal-fired plants, allowing them to take forward urbanization and to build up their economic development works. And, and that is that is having a major perturbation on the, on the world scene at present, um, as I shall indicate. The other point I just want to stress before I go back to that is this thing about energy poverty. This is another International Energy Agency slide from 2017, and it's showing that there's over a billion people uh, worldwide who live without access to electricity. There's some in Central and Southern America, a lot in Africa, a lot in the Middle East, and, in, and a significant portion in, in, in the rest of Asia. Considering we're in the 21st century, and considering there's so much going on around the rest of the world, the fact that over a billion people have almost no access to electricity, I think is actually an international disgrace, and it really does need to be addressed as a matter of urgency. That said, let's look at developments in Asia. We've got, uh, I've got four countries here, Bangladesh, China, India, Indonesia. Bangladesh, relatively small country, minding its own business a few years ago, and it now has plans for 60 gigawatt of new plants. It's got over $20 billion worth of funding already from China, India, Japan, and all the projects that are currently in development, that's not all 60 gigawatts, of course, but of the projects that are currently in development, about 24 gigawatts are USC units. China's continuing to build up uh, new high efficiency, low emissions technologies, coal-based technologies. Some 11 gigawatts is being installed this year and next by, just by China Energy, one of China's power generation companies, albeit a big one. And there's overall a very significant coal power increase in the country with also major developments now taking the technology beyond China's borders. India, coal is going to continue to maintain market share despite increasing renewables. <coughs> Excuse me. And government initiatives are promoting so supercritical, ultra supercritical, and advanced ultra supercritical technologies. In fact, India could well be taking the lead in de 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 demonstrating technologies where we have 700 degrees Celsius steam and high pressure in the in the power in the power generation systems. And its first USC plant was actually commissioned uh, earlier this year. And again, Indonesia has a lot of coal reasonable amount of gas, it's selling the gas overseas and building new coal plants, uh, of which they're adding 35 gigawatts by 2024, and about half of that will be coal. <coughs> These are uh, just five more uh, countries in Asia. Malaysia continues to introduce one gigawatt USC plants, continuing that steadily. Pakistan is another country that has a massive lignite deposit which it's been looking at at ways to uh, utilize. It's now working closely on as part of the Bells and Road Initiative. It's got Chinese finance coal plants being built to provide some 30% of its power demand. The Philippines has got its first supercritical unit. Japan has plans for 12 new ultra supercritical power plants. 
which are being developed or proposed in the range 600 to 1,000 megawatts each. And Vietnam, a place we recently visited where we held one of our Mercury em uh, emissions conferences. Um, uh, coal is forecast to provide over 50% of the country's power. They're planning more than 70 coal-powered units and they're expecting to do all this by 2028. This is the China Belt and Road Initiative to which I referred. Um, the, the Belt Initiative is the, is the land-based systems, which you can see there, starting in China and moving through the Stan countries, right across into, into parts of Europe, even into Western Europe. And then we have the, um, the Maritime Road Initiatives, which are the, the sea, sea routes, which is taking um, China technology and expertise to various other parts of the world, particularly South Africa and also going over to South, uh, Southern Africa and also to uh, South America. This is all about boosting economic and trade ties for China with 71 other countries at present. There may be more in the future. And that's actually equivalent to about a quarter of annual uh, GDP. And it's, they're doing boosting the trade, economic and trade ties to invest Chinese investments in energy and infrastructure, but also offering Chinese expertise and technology. So uh, if you take the Chinese renminbi, you are going to get the Chinese technology and the Chinese will be building the plants and they may even be operating them for, on your behalf. But it's a major program. China's invested in uh, 68 gigawatts of new coal-fired plant in these countries since 2014. And over the period of 2014 to 2017, six banks from China put together a $26 billion worth of loans for electricity projects in these target countries, of which 40% was for coal-fired generation. So this, uh, this very clear strategically focused program by China is actually uh, providing the funding and the technology and the expertise, or a lot of it at least, which is not necessarily now being met by Western development banks, as, as we've heard in recent webinars um, at the Clean Coal Center. Right, I'm nearly there. But I just want to spend a few minutes talking about non-energy products from coal, because we've been talking about how coal continue to make a, a, has a role to play in the uh, energy production, power production worldwide. Uh, but it also is being now seen as a key ma raw material for developing a number of non-energy products from coal, which are very important to a wide range of uh, uh, other non-energy applications. Um, and basically, uh, as I show in this slide, Already, the amount of coal that's being utilized is bet higher than 100 million tons a year. And it's being used to produce carbon fiber, nano materials as a source of rare earth elements. All of these can be contained from coal. And these products, the carbon fiber, the nano materials, the rare earth elements, are increasingly needed to produce specialist products. One to highlight, I think, is the manufacture of graphene. And you can make that now directly from coal. It's potentially a breakthrough technology and it's providing coal source materials for the latest uh, IT applications. Rare earth elements, as the name suggests, aren't particularly common, but they're a very valuable commodity essential to aerospace development. And in, indeed, you know, they're going to be used in control systems on wind turbines and so forth and uh, mobile phones, things like that. And again, they can be sourced either from coal off from the ash from coal after that coal has been utilized, let's say, as a fuel in a power plant. And people are now looking at what were seen as valueless um, ash residues from coal based processes and now looking to reprocess that ash if, if the rare earth element concentrations are high enough to make that economically worthwhile. The other thing I just want to highlight is lignite resources. They're, they're used in local power plants, but they can also be used to make agricultural humic products, fertilizers, and they can help to counter the increasing crisis of land desertification, which is a, a, a thing that needs to be considered as a, a particular threat in certain parts of the world. So, 
my last message. I think it's fair to say that coal has been around for a long time. In the UK, for example, the Romans, when they occupied our country back in the first century AD, in some cases utilized coal sources to provide the heat underground, under, under surface heat, under floor heating um, in the villas that they produced in our green and pleasant land. Uh, and coal has been around, as I said, for a long time. It successfully faced many energy efficiency and environmental challenges. And it's faced it through primarily through innovative technological developments and in many cases linking that with um, far reaching and far thinking techno um, policy and regulatory de developments to help drive forward the use of these uh, uh, use of coal in a more environmentally friendly manner. I think the challenge now is to maintain a role in the power sector and at the same time seek further sustainable opportunities such as non-energy projects products to allow us to continue to make great use of what is a very readily available um, feedstock energy source uh, on a worldwide basis. Of course, as these developments go forward, the clean, IEA Clean Coal Centre is going to provide independent analysis on these activities and it's going to make the findings available to all interested parties. So I urge you to look at our website. You can either then talk to myself if you have particular questions or particularly my colleague, Benedict de Brox, who is our, com uh, our communications manager. That, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention, is the end of my presentation. And if there are any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for your attention. difficult to answer. <laughs> okay, I have two questions from Mr. Ivan Gushkov. Is it possible to have my presentation? That's an easy one. Yes, it is. All our webinars, ever since the first one, many several years ago, are available on our website and you can download those really very easily. And if you have problems, we have contact points that will allow you to um, to help you to ensure you get that that web that webinar and indeed any others that you see that you have uh, interest in um, looking at your other question was could I please briefly comment on risks in Russia I'm not quite sure what you're meaning here I mean clearly Russia is a a source of um, of gas and is a source of coal and um, and provide, uh, well, in fact, one of our members is Suet, which is a Siberian coal company who we, we work with very closely. So I'm afraid I don't quite um, fully understand what you're talking about, a risk. Are these technical or political risks? Because I'm quite happy to talk about technical ones, but I would be, have to be more careful about the political ones. Thank you. I have a further question. What factors dictate whether developing countries deploy sub subcritical, supercritical, or USC technology for a new coal plant? That's a good question. Um, I think first and foremost, it's determined by the amount of power you're going to require. You can build subcritical units up to uh, 600 megawatts in size. The efficiency is at about 39% maximum. Uh, and from that, you can determine how much power you can produce from that. But it's certainly clear that if you can build supercritical or ultra supercritical, they will tend to be bigger plants. You won't really get supercritical and ultra supercritical smaller than 600 megawatts, and usually they're 660 to 1000 megawatts in size. So you would want to be able to uh, have access to a, a certain amount of capacity that's going to allow you to make best use of those particular technologies. I think the other point that has to come in there is the cost. And there's been a number of studies done on this uh, by ourselves, by the International Energy Agency and others. And all things being equal, if you the, the capital investment required for a supercritical or ultra supercritical plant per unit output is higher than for a subcritical, but the operating costs are much lower because the efficiencies are higher and you end up with less, you need less coal, so your operating costs are lower. But of course, the 
the capital investment is going to be vulnerable to the, the um, interest rates that you're having to pay on that capital when you when you're utilizing it. I think that's the end of it. So I'm going to pass over to Benedicti who, oh, sorry, we now have an, another question. <laughs> sorry, one more. What risks in general you do I see in building a modern coal electric power plant in Russia in regions with large coal deposits? Um, I see problems in involving Asian investors. Um, that's probably quite true. Uh, I think you've got to ask yourself, why are you going to build a modern coal electric power plant in, in Russia in regions with large coal deposits? Because they're reasonably remote. And you would be thinking whether that's the best way to deal with it. I suppose it's depending what the, the power levels are going to be like and transmission costs are going to be like and where, where the market is for your electricity. Uh, sorry, that's a rather generic um, answer, but it's difficult to say much more on, on the basis of that information. I'm now definitely going to pass over to Benedict de Brox, who's got a few more words to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening in today, and our slides will soon be available for download on our website. The next webinar from us will be on the 11th of December at 12, as usual, noon, and will be presented by Toby Lockwood. The title is Electricity Market Designs for Reliable Grid and Their Impact on Coal Pump. Thank you very much and goodbye.